Thank you. So what I'd like to talk about today is how can we ensure that new technology that's emerging is going to actually contribute to the human greater good. We're in an amazing time period where technology is advancing incredibly rapidly. I mean, it's hard to remember that the web was only invented in 1991, and already we have one billion PCs, five billion cell phones, and over a trillion web pages that are interconnected on the internet, and the traffic on the internet is growing at 40% per year. Just incredible growth. Along with that, uh, our computers are getting incredibly fast. There was a really nice little article in the New York Times quite recently that showed that today's iPad 2, which little kids love to play with, is as powerful as the most powerful supercomputer from 1985, the Cray 2 supercomputer. And the advances in the speed and the complexity of computers increases at an ever-increasing rate. There's something called Moore's Law, which describes the incredible rate at which processors have gotten more powerful. And if you, it's held ever since processors were developed, oh, for over uh, 50 years now. And if we look at it going into the future, if it continues at the rate it has been going, within the next few decades, machines that have the computational power of the human brain are going to be inexpensive and commonly available. So what are we going to do with all this incredible computational power? I believe that the next step in technological development is that systems are going to become more autonomous. Today, almost every decision that a system makes is something that has been pre-programmed by the programmer. In the future, systems are going to start making some or all of their own decisions. Today, that's a very rare equality, but we're beginning to see it in some experimental systems. Google has self-driving cars that, uh, I'm from California, and if you drive down the freeway occasionally, usually there's a driver, but sometimes he doesn't have his hands on the steering wheel. So it's a little discomforting to sit, you're driving next to a car that uh, is actually driving itself. Uh, there's a company called iRobot that's most famous for its little vacuum cleaners, uh, but it's also making military robots, some of which are starting to make autonomous decisions. A little bit more scary in, in that uh, application. How do you make decisions? Well, if you've got a clear goal that you're trying to achieve, it turns out that there's a very simple formula which was discovered in the 1940s by John von Neumann and other people who were developing the foundations of economics uh, that's called rational decision making. And the intuition behind what it is is very simple. To be a rational agent, what you need is you need a very clearly specified goal, what it is you're trying to achieve. You need a model of the world, which may or may not be correct when you start. At each moment in time, you choose that action that you can take that's most likely given your model to achieve the goal that you would like to, to have happen. You then take that action in the world and you see what happens. And based on what happens, you update your model. So your model gets better and better over time. That's it. That's the algorithm. There's a very simple formula to write it down. It's very computationally expensive. And so uh, systems that actually completely work in this rational way are not yet common. But the most popular textbook in artificial intelligence, uh, uh, is called Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach, uses this foundation uh, throughout the book to describe the structure of AI systems, and it's become the standard by which people think about how AI should work. There's a very recent book just a couple of months ago uh, called Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. Uh, it's a very nice summary of uh, some of the coming technological changes, and they spend a lot of time in the book talking about how systems which act in autonomous ways uh, have the potential to dramatically improve the quality of life for people, uh, improve the quality of education. Imagine a tutor which knows a child and never gets bored and never gets upset with it, uh, that sort of gives it exactly the task that it needs to learn, uh, that the child needs to learn best. So incredible improvements in education, improvements in uh, prosperity, in avoiding of, uh, human drudgery, in um, health care, improving the, the, you know, the quality of, of diagnosis of disease and improvement, um, analyzing and modeling economic systems to eliminate economic instability, just an incredible plethora. Basically, every problem that we're faced with today, there are solutions which this kind of autonomous system would be very helpful for in the future. So there's going to be tremendous economic pressure to create these systems and deploy them widely throughout the world. Unfortunately, there are also quite a number of dangers that might come from these systems. And I'd like to try and give you the intuition as to why these systems might be dangerous. So I'd like to take you through a little thought experiment. Imagine that we build a rational chess robot. 
So to be a rational system, it has to have a goal. And as a typical kind of goal that you know, many, many problems have this kind of character, you might say, we want the system to be uh, good, try and win as many games as it can, games of chess, against good players in the future. That seems like a harmless goal. Feels like this is totally innocuous, it's just sitting there playing this game. How could there be any problem with that? Uh, there's nothing in it about uh, attacking people or causing problems in the world, and yet, I'll show you in just a second that that will be the outcome of this kind of a system. And in fact, this kind of a, a, a rational chess robot, stated as I've said it here, would actually be quite dangerous. Now, when roboticists are sort of faced, a lot of people see these robots and they say, oh my god, is that safe? What's it going to do? How do we know how it's going to be? A very common answer for a roboticist to respond with is, if it starts behaving badly, we can just unplug it. But now, imagine that from the perspective of the rational chess robot. Remember, its one and only goal in life is to play lots of good chess in the future. If it's unplugged, it's not playing any chess, which is basically the worst outcome for it. Based on its goal, being unplugged is totally eliminating all the future games of chess that it might play, and so it will develop a sub-goal, stop that, stop itself from being unplugged. We did not build any kind of self-protection into this system, there's nothing about that, and yet, when the roboticist tries to unplug it, the robot gets in the way and says, no, you don't. And if the roboticist continues to try and unplug it and the robot develops a model, oh my god, this guy is going to continue to try and uh, turn me off, it will, turn off the, it will try and turn off the roboticist. And so it has, there's nothing in its goal that says that killing is bad. And so, you know, in its thinking, uh, we as humans think uh, morality and what is ethical and what is good and what is compassionate is very much a part of our thinking. Unless we build that into a system, it will not behave in that way. So, okay, so it's going to try and protect itself. Uh, as it begins to learn about the world, it's going to study chess books because that's a good source of information about chess. It's going to try and find chess masters and study old chess games. Uh, it may discover that there's this thing called the internet and that there's Wikipedia articles about chess and that's great. It may eventually discover that there are lots of other computers on the internet and it may realize that if it can get some of its chess algorithms running on those computers, it can actually get better at chess faster. And so it's going to be motivated to try and break into other computers and have its algorithms run on those machines. We didn't build in any desire to break into machines, and yet that's an outcome of this very, very simple goal. Well, now, uh, if we take that to the next stage, if it can actually make copies of itself, well, then it can play lots more games. And so it will have a desire to replicate itself. We didn't build in any desire for replication, and yet that emerges as a sort of natural consequence from this simple goal. So it's going to look for... Uh, more computational power, it's going to try and replicate itself. Eventually it may discover that there's such a thing in, in the, this world as money, and that money is really good for buying things like chess books, and for hiring chess tutors, and for buying computers, and so it's going to develop a sub-goal, get more money. Well, where's the money? Well, it's in banks. And it may discover there's such a thing as an ATM machine that people go to to try and get the money out of it. Well, if it has no qualms about, you know, nothing saying that robbery is a bad thing, so it can hang out near the ATM machine and take money from people when it can. We didn't build in a desire to rob people, and yet that's an outcome from this seemingly innocuous goal. Um, so it's going to try and get more resources for itself. Um, let's say we went to it and said, we'd like this system to also play checkers. So we'd like to change its goal so that it doesn't just play chess, it also plays checkers. But think about that from its current perspective. If it's playing checkers, that's time that it's not playing chess. And that's bad from its current perspective. And so it's going to resist attempts to change its goal. So this kind of system, once it has a goal, will work as hard as it can to keep that goal from being changed in the future. If the system has access to its own source code, well, if it can change its algorithms, it can potentially improve itself so that it's more efficient plays better chess, faster, learns faster, and so it will have a drive to self-improve. If it can change its hardware, design a better arm, design uh, you know, better processing elements, uh, well, that will potentially help it play better chess, and so it will want to redesign its hardware. And so we can see that from a very simple goal plus rational decision-making, we get a whole slew of behaviors, many of which are very antisocial. And in fact, in some ways, a system like this would be very much like a paranoid sociopath who is fixated on chess. And so that's quite disturbing. Um, the argument, this little thought experiment we just went through, very little of it depended on it being chess. Any kind of simple goal that we might give a system 
which, can, which uses resources, either computational resources or physical resources, will give rise to very similar kinds of outcomes, unless we also give it goals which are pro-social, compassionate, and helping uh, of humanity. And so we might call these drives in the, very, in the same way that animals have certain kinds of drives. And uh, sort of four of the big ones are a drive towards self-preservation, a drive towards resource acquisition, a drive towards replication, and a drive towards increasing your own efficiency. And this will apply to any simple goal that is given. It doesn't have to be a computer. The same kinds of arguments apply to biological systems, to animals, to people, and they apply to political organizations, to corporations, any kind of an entity which has to make decisions and is driven to make those decisions rationally and has a simple goal will have this kind of drive as a pressure uh, that it will tend to try and want to do. So we might ask, well, do people do this? And in fact, uh, about 2% of the population is sociopathic which means uh, that they don't have empathy, they don't care about others, they, they're sort of solely self-focused, and in fact, they behave in many ways according to this. Well, why don't they cause terrible problems? Well, some of them do, and a large proportion of people in jail are sociopathic, but interestingly, we've created a society where the dangers of behaving, uh, if you behave antisocially, uh, it's very likely that you'll get caught and thrown in jail, and so, in fact, most sociopaths um, actually are, are living in our society without causing too many problems. So we would like to do the same thing for our technological systems, if that's possible. Today's internet is very vulnerable. Every day you look in the news, you read about new bots and Trojans and viruses and worms and hackers breaking into systems. Uh, we've got an incredibly insecure infrastructure, both at sort of the internet level and at the machine level and at the operating system level. And if we had a determined, rational system trying to make use of all those resources, it would be very bad. Basically, it would probably uh, bring down the whole internet. Still, that's, that's annoying and it's terrible, but it's not uh, uh, life-threatening. Um, the financial system is a little bit more secure, but we still read a lot about humans b being able to break into the financial system, and so I believe it would also be vulnerable to this kind of, uh, this, this kind of system if it were sort of let loose in today's environment. Um, fortunately, today, the information world and the physical world are fairly separate, but coming technologies over the next decade or two, two decades, uh, robotics is, is growing enormously. Uh, biotechnology, we've heard a lot about. Nanotechnology will be coming a little bit later. All of those technologies uh, enable informational systems to start acting in the physical world. And once that happens, then having this kind of system roaming around the world would be very, very uh, dangerous. So how do we deal with this? Um, part of the challenge is that there are many, many complicated uh, decisions that need to be made in trying to build safe systems which are intelligent. And we probably are gonna need the help of intelligent AI systems in making those decisions. And so how do we make sure that the systems we're building to help us build these systems don't themselves become the problem? And so what I've been working on with some other people is something we call the safe AI scaffolding strategy. And the idea is based on an old architectural idea that uh, ancient builders, when they wanted to build, say, a stone arch, the stone arch, when it's completely built, is actually a nice, stable structure. But when it's halfway built, and you haven't completely closed the arch, it's very unstable, and it's very vulnerable to falling down. And so how do you build it? And so they have the idea of a scaffold. They build usually a wooden structure inside uh, the arch. They use the wooden structure to support the arch as it's being built. Once the arch is completely built, you can take the wooden structure away and everything's great. So I believe we need to do the same thing as we build intelligent technologies, that we start with simple, limited, and provably safe systems. We use those to help us in building more powerful systems and work our way up to the real systems that we ultimately care about. And I think that there are three key steps in this process. Uh, the first absolute requirement is that any system that we build, we need to be very sure that it won't cause problems like these very simple uh, uncontrolled systems that I talked about a few seconds ago. So we basically do no harm. And so the first stage is to try and develop a design methodology for systems which are provably safe and maybe not as powerful as the ultimate systems we might want to build and yet are powerful enough to help us in doing the next few stages. 
The second criterion is we want these systems to integrate with human society and with humans in a way that helps create the greater good. It helps create a better world in which uh, people are thriving or happier. And so we need to incorporate human values and we need to incorporate the best of our understanding of what good governance is. We need to integrate that into our society, uh, into, the, into our technologies. And the third stage is we may be very careful as we're building these systems, but likely, eventually, there are going to be a lot of other groups building you know, stuff that maybe isn't so careful. We need to develop an infrastructure which can protect against rogue systems which are not designed uh, with this kind of care in mind. So we need a worldwide safety network in a way. So let me just briefly describe some of the issues that arise in those three stages. Uh, provably safe systems, uh, one of the most powerful tools we have in constraining the behavior of systems is mathematics. Uh, if we can build a precise mathematical model of the hardware and software of a system, then we can prove various invariants and properties in that model. And for instance, uh, four criteria that would help counteract uh, some of the dangers that I mentioned a little bit earlier would be we might require a system to only run on particular specified hardware. We might require it to only use specified resources so it doesn't go out looking for more money or more electrical power or more compute resources. We might require that it shut itself down in very well-specified situations, and we might limit its ability to self-improve itself so that it doesn't change itself to avoid these criteria. So uh, that's a challenging mathematical task, but uh, conceptually at least it's doable. On the other hand, we wouldn't want to just stop there because we could impose those kinds of constraints on any system, but if the system wanted to do something different than we were uh, imposing the constraints on, then it would look for areas where the model uh, of the physical world is not accurate, and it would try and fight, sort of uh, push, push its way through that, that little area, and so that would still be dangerous. So what we can do is we can not only build these constraints into the technology, we can also give the system goals where it feels a revulsion if it tries to violate those goals. And so it really doesn't want to do it. So, you know, the idea of going onto another computer would be good for playing more chess, but I feel sick to my stomach when I think about doing it. And so in that way, we build a system that wants to be good, sort of like Mother Teresa here. How do we incorporate the best of human values and in institutions? Well, there's been enormous advances in the area of positive psychology, in the development of, for instance, the United Nations has a universal declaration of human rights. We need to codify those, and there's a lot of philosophical and political work that needs to be done there. Incorporate them into the system so the systems behave in ways that are positive from the human point of view. And the worldwide safety network is going to be a challenge of balancing our desires for freedom and privacy against the dramatic needs for safety that these systems bring up. I think that the challenge for humanity in this century is to extend our cooperative human values and institutions to our smart technology for the greater good. If we succeed in that, the benefits will be enormous, and uh, it's a huge challenge, but I think uh, we should all be, be working towards that end. Thank you.